what do we believe and why do we believe it? That's an important question, right? I think we should know what we believe and be able to explain, to articulate what we believe, to be grounded in what we believe. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this new series that we're starting today. Basic training, being prepared to defend our faith. Not in a, you know, we're not looking for a fight. This isn't, uh, we're not going out trying to just start arguments with folks. Um, This is... Being prepared, as the scripture says, always be prepared to defend your faith, to give an account for what you believe. And that's, that's what we hope to accomplish over the next 10 weeks as we walk through some of the basic doctrines of our faith. Beginning today with where uh, is a reasonable beginning, and that is with God. Because what we do or don't understand about God affects the other doctrines that we do or don't understand or our ability to understand those doctrines. And so we should attempt to understand him. As a matter of fact, within each human being, we are all hardwired to know our creator. We have within us a longing to know God. Who is he? What is he like? What does he do? Um, We may not ask those questions verbally, but we ask those questions, all of us, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, have deep within us, put there by God, a desire to know our Creator. And so we should attempt to do that. Um, Some folks know about God, but they don't know Him. They don't know about Him personally. Uh, Several years ago, just uh, when I was in seminary, I was attending the, the Birmingham Extension of the New Orleans Seminary at the time before I went on campus. And some friends and I, we were eating lunch at McAllister's during our lunch break that day. And uh, we were all waiting in line, ordering our food. And all of a sudden, one of my friends, you know, and, and most, most of these guys, they, they like to play a good joke. And so um, that one of the guys says, hey, Bart Starr just walked in the restaurant. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not going to go introduce myself because you're playing a joke, you know. And I turn around and I looked, and and, and sure enough, it was Bart Starr walked right into the restaurant. And uh, and so we all huddled up and got up the courage together to go introduce ourselves to him. And we did. He was very gracious. He spoke to us for a few moments. Uh, it was a great a great moment, you know. I, I'm an Alabama fan. I uh, got to meet a star and it was it was a nice moment and so I can honestly say that I met him uh, someone famous I met but I cannot say that I knew him well I mean we weren't but we didn't go we didn't eat together afterwards you know he didn't invite us to join him for lunch but I know of him and, and I'm afraid that's where a lot of people are with God they know of God but they don't know him they don't know him personally and listen it's it's admittedly difficult to understand God. There are things about God that we cannot understand. He cannot be defined completely in human terms. If we could understand God, he wouldn't be much of a God at all, would he? I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be uh, worthy of worship. Uh, but just because we cannot understand him completely does not mean we shouldn't try to understand him. As a matter of fact, there are specific things that God has revealed to us about himself. He wants us to know him. Yes, there are things we cannot understand, but there is enough we can understand to keep us busy for the rest of our lives. Um, And he reveals himself to us through his creation, but he also reveals himself to us through his word. And that's where we're going to be over the next several weeks, but today primarily as we look at the doctrine of God, who he is, what he does, we're going to look to his word. Now, as we go through this, uh, we're gonna, there are going to be some, some divisions that, we, that I, I, I categorize God, divisions that I place him into, and that's, uh, don't, don't misunderstand, I'm not communicating that God is, is divided. God is one. He is the one and only true God. Yes, there is the mystery of the Trinity, but he is three in one. He is one God. He is unified. And so our divisions, as we go through this, this morning, is, is for the purpose of our understanding, so that we can gain a better understanding uh, of God. Uh, And also, as you look at your notes this morning, don't be intimidated by your notes. You do have a book in front of you, but I'm giving this to you to take with you for your benefit, for your study, 
Uh, connection groups are going to be walking through this material as well. And so you can take this home and have this with you. Connection group leaders, you can have this to assist in your preparation. But this morning, we're going to look at God from really two perspectives. Okay, We're going to look at the activity of God, what He does, and the attributes of God, who He is. And with both of those, we will gain a better understanding of our Creator. So first, let's look at the activity of God. The activity of God, because most of what we know about God is by what we have seen Him do. Um, His activity in our world. And there is a lot to be learned about the nature of God by looking at His activity. Uh, The Bible describes the different activities of God, one of which being that He is creative. The creative activity of God. The creative activity of God is how the Bible describes the creation of the world, the universe that we live in. It was His creating, His creative activity that produced the world that we live in. God is creative. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Colossians 1.16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the invisible and the visible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Regardless of what anyone says, the source of all life is God. True science does not contradict God. It complements his creative activity. Talking about disagreeing with the idea that some of some people that scientific enlightenment and religious belief are incompatible, Dr. Werner von Braun said this. He said, I consider it one of the greatest tragedies of our times that this idea is so widely believed. The reality is science continually turns up further evidence to support a divine creator, a design, intelligent design. The late Dr. Arthur Compton, Nobel Prize winner in physics, said this. He said, for myself, faith begins with the realization that a supreme intelligence brought the universe into being and created man. It is not difficult for me to have this faith, for it is incontrovertible that we, where there is a plan, there is intelligence. In other words, it didn't just happen by chance. It's more, it takes more faith to believe that than to believe there was a design, that there was order An intelligence behind that design, an orderly unfolding universe testifies to the truth of the most majestic statement ever uttered in the beginning, God. You know, we can talk about the specifics of creation, and there are some things we don't understand, but but just to put it simply, in the beginning, God did it. All life, everything that we see, the source of that is God. Ordered creation screams, I have a creator. It points to the creator. And so God is creative. He's also in control. Another activity we see is the controlling activity of God. And it's closely related to the creative activity because the same God who created now controls his creation. He is actively involved in controlling his creation. He is provident. He is the sustainer. He could have created the world and us and left us to fend for ourselves. Thankfully, he didn't do that. The deist believes that, believes that there is a God, but he is completely transcendent. He is above and separated from his creation, not involved in any way in his creation. But it is a mistake to believe that because the world, the universe, could no more control itself than it could create itself. There is a divine creator who actively controls and, and, and runs, keeps it all together, his creation. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things... He created all things, but by him all things hold together. The same God who created the world at the beginning holds the world together today. Think about this. If God were just to loosen his grip on the universe just slightly for only a second, the entire universe would be thrown into chaos. He created... He also sustains, he controls his creation. God is in complete control, actively involved, imminent, imminent, actively involved in controlling his creation. He is also a redeemer. 
Thankfully, another activity we see of God is his redeeming activity. Uh, Tragedy occurs in the story of creation when man chose to sin. And at that point, that brought in the need for redemption. Adam chose to sin and thereby separated himself from God. And Adam's story is our story. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all guilty of sin. Adam's story is our story. So with sin, we are separated from God. As a result, a bridge needed to be built. Now, none of us can bridge that built. Or can build that bridge. It's easy for me to say, right? (laughs) None of us can, can build that. But the story of God building that bridge is the story of redemption. Um, He he made provisions for us, the same God who created the world, the same God who controls the world. When man chose to sin, that God, his activity now is redeeming mankind. We were separated from God. We were unlovable, yet he chose to love us, which is amazing that God would go that far to redeem us. But that is one of his activities. God redeems mankind. A little boy once said at, the cru- said at the crucifixion, if God were there, he would have stopped the whole thing. The reality is God was there, redeeming mankind. That's what he was doing. And in John 3, 16, I love how the Holman states John 3, 16, God loved the world in this way. If you need proof of God's love, if you need an example of God's love, God loves the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son so that who, everyone who believes in him will have everlasting life will not perish but have everlasting life that is God's redemption of man second Corinthians 5 17 if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation the old things have passed away and look new things have come God only only not only did he create but God also he controls but he also redeems but then one day he will finish what he started another activity of God God finishes what he starts, and that includes creation. I mean, this, this is the consummating activity of God. The one who creates, controls, and redeems will one day consummate his creation. He, there's gonna, it's going to come to an end. The ancient Greeks said that history was just a, a vicious cycle, a series of vicious cycles. The communists would say that it's just a series of random events, that it's all by accident. But we believe that history is going somewhere. That it is headed in a direction and one day will come to completion. That this story, the past, present, and future will one day come to an end. That God will bring it all to a close. We are headed somewhere. There is a purpose. There is design. There is intent behind it all. God will finish what he started. And the key to understanding the consummating activity of God, that he is a finisher, is the second coming of Christ. Now, we will look at that later on in this series. But for today, let's just make the point that the one true God who began the world will also finish what he started. Plain and simple. God will finish what he started. We can believe in that. So in all of God's activities, we learn something about him, right? We learn that he created, that he controls, that he redeems, that he will finish what he started. There's a lot to be learned there. But we also learn a lot about God from his attributes. We've looked at what he does. Now let's look at who he is, the attributes of God. Now when we use the word attributes, we're not talking about adding anything or taking anything away from God. What are we talking about? Well, here's a definition. We're talking about the attributes of God. We're talking about evidences of God's unified divine being, characteristics of God which properly belong to God. We're looking not at things that make him better or worse, more or less. We're looking at different ways that God has manifested his presence in in, in mankind. And we see that. We see it with each manifestation. We learn something about his character. We learn something about the complexity of his character for one, but who he is. There are three phases that we're going to use to describe the nature of God. Three different phases, and then we will explore a little more about the the attributes of God. One is that God is spirit. God is spirit. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what does this indicate? Well, this indicates that God has a personality. We'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Second, the second phase to describe the nature of God is that God is light. God is light. 1 John 1, 5. Now, th- this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. This, is, this indicates holiness, the complete and total absence of darkness or sin. God is completely pure. He is holy. God is also love. He is described not as just loving, but he is love. 1 John 4, 8, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. I mean, I can't truly know love unless I know God because he is love. In 1 John 4, 16, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God. God, And God remains in him. Therefore, looking at these facets of God's personality, of who he is, uh, his attributes, we can say, one, that God is a personal spirit. You know, most people believe that God is a spirit, but some don't believe that he's personal, that he's a person. I'm not talking about God having a body. I mean, we think of a person, we think of a body. Jesus did take the form of a man, but in doing so, he limited some of his divine attributes. Omnipresence, for example. But God is, you know, a person, being a person doesn't depend on having a body or not. You can be personal, and there are characteristics of being a person that are, that are, are common, that are universal. And we see all of these characteristics in God. I mean, five different characteristics specifically. One is intellect, the ability to think, the ability to reason. Uh, and certainly God has that. We see the will. A person has a will. The ability to take, not just to think, but to put those thoughts into action. We also see morality. Uh, a person is moral. The, the, a consciousness, the ability to tell right from wrong. And, and we're all born with that. Now, you can kill your conscience over time, and people do that. But you don't have to tell a child that they've done something wrong. I mean, we know naturally right from wrong. We have a conscience. And that's part of being a, a, a person. There's sensibility, another characteristic of personality, the ability to feel uh, love, patience, mercy, wrath. All of these are described, used to describe God, the ability to feel. And then self-communication, the ability to communicate with others. And God has all of those things, right? I mean, he has the ability to think, the power to think, the ability to, to put that thought into action. Uh, he, he knows right from wrong. He defines what's right and wrong. And he's touched by our infirmities. We see that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, among other ways that we see God's feelings described. And he communicates himself. He has revealed himself to us, thankfully. We know about God because he has communicated and he continues to communicate with us through his word. So God has all of those things. He is a real, living, spiritual personality. I sin against a person. I put my faith in a person. I pray to a person and that person is God. He is a personal spirit, a person, not distant and disconnected. Yes, he is transcendent above his creation, but he is also very much involved in the lives of those who are his. He is a personal spirit. But God also, we can describe him as holy love. And when you look at the attributes of God, you can really, you can put them into the two classifications, the two categories of holiness and love. When we see God manifest his presence, it's in those two ways. Um, all of them can really be categorized in that and, and, and summed up by either his holiness or his love. But these are, are, are not separate sides of God. You can't separate these two. If we just emphasize the holiness of God, then he's a, a, a mean, tyrannical dictator who, who is separate from his creation and could care less what happens to us. To emphasize only his holiness is a wimpy, spineless God who doesn't care about whether or not his people sin. He's just, he's just merciful, no, no justice, no wrath. None of that. But if you emphasize both equally, then we get an accurate picture of who God is to the best of our ability. And that's what the Bible teaches. It's not two different gods. It is the same God who manifests himself in different ways. The holiness of God and the love of God. So let's start with holiness. What, is, what are we saying here? Holiness means that God is set apart. 
He is separate from his creation. And he is, he is, there's none other like him. No one, other, no one like him. I mean, he is distinct. He is separate. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Rudolf Otto says that he is wholly other. He's not just the man upstairs. I mean, he is completely and t- totally different. He is, as Isaiah says, the Holy One of Israel. God is the antithesis of sin. And as Norman Snaith says, his holiness is his positive activity against sin. I mean, he is distinct. He is separate. He is pure. And there are seven properties. We're just going to walk through these quickly together. Seven properties of God's holiness. And this is where your book of notes comes in. You've got all of these written down. You can take these with you. But let's look at the different properties of God's holiness. Each of these express some facet of his holiness. One is the wrath of God. We see his holiness displayed in his wrath. He is the righteous judge, the standard. He cannot, he, he doesn't trifle with sin. He will not. Romans 1.18, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. John 3.36, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains in him. God's wrath, he is holy, he is just, he is righteous, he cannot tolerate sin. And and his justice is maintained through Christ's sacrifice for our sin. The payment's made, penalties, uh, you know, the punishment's been served, but he he, he still doesn't, he's still not okay with sin. And he is God. God's wrath is at work in the present, and then one day when you look forward, fast forward to the return of Christ, that too will be consummated. At the end of time. So there's the wrath of God. There's also the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Isaiah 5, 16. But the Lord of hosts is exalted by his, right, his justice. And holy, the holy God is distinguished by his righteousness. You know, righteousness is really God's holiness in action. I mean, it is, I mean every, he, his acts are righteous. Everything he does is perfect. The power of God is another aspect of his holiness the power of God in Ezekiel chapter 36 God is he he, he talks about we see a, a display of his holiness we see a display of his love and his mercy you know using the nation of Israel um, but we also see his holiness displayed his power displayed when they came to the nations he says where they went they profaned my holy name He could have wiped them out then, but he did not. Because it was said about them, these are the people of Yahweh, yet they had to leave his land in exile. Then I had concern for my holy name. Why did God redeem man? Why did he redeem the nation of Israel time and time again? Not for, yes, we benefit, and it is on some level for our sakes, but ultimately it's for his name's sake. The holiness of his name. I had concern for my holy name which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my holy name. Why does he display his power? For the sake of his name. His name is holy, which you profaned, he said, among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. And here's another key sentence. The nations will know that I am Yahweh. The declaration of the Lord God, how will they know? When I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. Why does God redeem mankind? Why did he redeem the nation of Israel? Yes, he loves us. He wants us to be saved. But ultimately, when we glorify him when we serve him when his power is made evident through us it brings glory and honor to his name god created to bring glory to his name he controls his creation to bring glory to his name he redeemed mankind to bring glory to his name and he will finish what he started to honor and glorify his name his name is worthy of honor and glory and and he can carry out his purposes for the world and his kingdom and your life nothing Nothing is too hard for God, and we desperately need that power in our lives, don't we? 
I mean, we cannot survive. I mean, there is the, the element here that God is glorifying his name, and yes, he does. But there's also the personal implication here that God's power is available to me. And that he, is all, he offers that power so that I can live my life. Now, everybody probably, at least every adult in this room probably has a cell phone, right? Y'all remember the days when cell phones were just for making phone calls? That is so not the case anymore. I mean, this is a mini computer. I mean, you, you do everything. I mean, you surf the internet, you text, you message. I mean, you know, it's got a, it's, it's got a word processor. I mean, you know, all of what used to be this big hunking thing on our desk is now in the palm of our hand. But the reality is, because of everything that's on here, what is the constant thing that cell phone, smartphone companies battle? With each new phone, they advertise, hey, a new, stronger, longer life battery, right? And they're constantly looking to improve batteries because when you put all of that stuff into this small device, the battery is going to get drained. I mean, you, you, you know, surf the Internet for a little while on your phone and see how quickly that battery goes down. And when your battery goes down at the end of the day, even if you don't use it a lot at the end of the day, your battery's drained pretty well. What do you do? Well, you take it and you plug it in. It comes with this nifty little charging cable that you can take and you can plug in. And you've got a couple options, right? You know, if you're, at your, if you're at your computer, at your desk or whatever, you can plug this into your computer, certainly. Um, it used to, you have to do that to sync between devices. You don't even have to do that anymore, which also drains the battery. But you can, you can plug this into the computer. If you're in your car, if you have a USB port, or even if you don't, you can buy one of these little things. They're very cheap at the gas station or the dollar store. You can get one of these and plug it in, and that you can charge your phone in your car. Um, if you use it as a GPS or whatever, you can plug it into your car. Or if you're at home, you've got the charging block, right? You can actually charge it. You can plug it in and charge it in the wall. There are several options to do that. But if you don't do that, what's going to happen? I mean, your phone's not going to be usable. It's going to be drained. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I, at the end of the day, sometimes I'm drained, you know, I go about, and, and my desire, my heart's desire is to serve the Lord. It really is. And I want to do that every day, and I try to do that every day. I can only do that in His power and His strength. And at the end of the day, sometimes I am zapped. And I don't feel like I have any power, but there are certain ways. And I, I, don't, use, I don't want to use this phrase. I, I don't like when we use this flippantly. I'm just going to go get recharged. That's not, don't, don't misunderstand. But there are ways that God recharges us. Being filled with His Spirit. We're filled at the point of salvation, but we are filled daily with the Spirit. And that's how we are recharged, so to speak. We plug into His Word and spend time in His Word. And He fills us with Himself and empowers us. There's power in the Word of God to transform and to equip. We are filled, we are empowered, we are recharged when we spend time with Him, communicating with Him. Yes, in that quiet place, in your prayer closet alone. With God, but also as we commune with Him throughout the day, He recharges us and He fills us with His Spirit. We are filled, we are recharged when we gather with God's people and we depend on the encouragement of God's people where the Spirit of God is, where He dwells. His presence is manifested in a powerful way. And so His power, we've got to stay plugged in because if we don't, then we will be doing it on our own and we can't do it on our own. It is a miracle, one of the many miracles of our faith that God chooses to allow us his power, to use us, to work in and through us. But we have the power of God. And ultimately, even that, even using his power through us is for his glory and for his name's sake. We are here to glorify our creator. So there's the power of God. There's also the glory of God, closely related. Exodus 15, 11, Lord, who is like you among the gods, who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders. The burning, holy, manifested presence of God in the Old Testament. You had the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, the burning, manifested presence of God. In the New Testament, you have the person of Jesus Christ, the manifested presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us. But it is his glory. All of that is, is wrapped up in the glory of God. Then there's the eternity of God. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are 
God. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For the high and exalted one lives forever, who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this. I live in a high and holy place, and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the oppressed. I mean, this does highlight the distinction, the barrier between the holy, holiness of God that he is transcendent, but it also talks about his willingness to be involved in mankind and his willingness to intervene in mankind. God who is without sin is before time and above time. I mean, God is willing to intervene, but he can intervene and he can redeem because he is and always has been, and he is the holy, righteous God, the changelessness of God. God never changes. Psalm 102, verse 27. But you are the same. Your years will never end. I mean, this is manifested in I mean, it's who he is, his being, his character, his purpose. He's never changing. But we do see in the scriptures God depicted as changing his mind. We see him repenting, but it's not in the same way that man repents. Right? And admittedly, those passages are difficult, but the best way, I believe, to categorize those passages is under the providence of God. God is simply, God knew, always knew what was going to happen. He's being described in human terms for our benefit. And for the benefit of those, he's actively working with those, like Moses, one of those examples. And he is, he, he's working with them to bring them, them along in his plan for them. I mean, God has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there's the changelessness of God. There's also the wisdom of God. Another facet of his holiness. Psalm 104, verse 24. How countless are your works, Lord. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. The wisdom of God is seen in both creation and redemption. All of those things that we talked about, all of his activity. Creation, controlling, redeeming, finishing. And the wisdom of God is seen in it all, in the perfection, the complexity of creation. All of these characteristics are wedded together, though, by the holiness of God. And all of these things come together. So how do we reconcile the transcendence of God, the holiness, that he is distinct, he is separate from his creation because he is? How do we reconcile that with the eminence of God, that he is actively involved in his creation? Well... If holiness makes him separate, then it's his love that makes him imminent. It's his love that drives him to be involved. He is love. And so he, he, by nature, is going to show that love. And that is, we see that when God manifests himself, we see it, it is love, it is mercy, it is grace. But it is because of who he is. The New Testament word, agape, love, is talking about that that unmotivated, nothing external motivates. It is committed love. It is selfless love. It is true love. 1 Corinthians 13 describes it. That is also the word that John uses to describe God when he says God is love. That this is an unmotivated, this is an undeserved, it is committed, it is steadfast love. And that is who God is. Just like with God's holiness, we see his love expressed in certain ways. So let's walk through these together. Ways God's love is expressed. One is God, His grace, the grace of God. We'll refer to this verse a couple of times, Exodus 33, 19. I will cause all my goodness, he says. He's speaking to Moses, God is. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I am gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, for you are saved by grace through faith. How? By grace. Through faith, he will be gracious to whom he's gracious, and he'll have compassion on whom he has compassion. This is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. This is love in action. Grace is unmerited favor. It's a gift that I don't deserve. And then there's mercy, the mercy of God, closely related to grace, but different. Again, Exodus thirty-three nineteen. look at the last part of that verse. He says, I'll, have gra I'll be gracious to whom I am gracious, but I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He gives grace, he withholds punishment. That's compassion. You know, we don't get what we deserve, punishment. That's mercy. And so the gift of grace, he's gracious to us. He shows us 
favor, he shows us his love, he saves us, redeems us, he withholds punishment, which is mercy. Not getting what I deserve. Grace is the gift I don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what I do deserve. And we all deserve punishment, separation from God. But he's merciful. Closely related here. It's his readiness to share in our distress, his willingness to intervene. Um, The patience of God is another aspect of his love. The patience of God. Exodus 34, 6. Then the Lord passed in front of him, Moses again, and proclaimed Yahweh. Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. We see the patience of God in his preservation of men, of creation, I mean, as a whole, but especially as man continues to sin. And God could wipe out the whole earth at any moment, yet he waits. He's patient so that those who haven't come to know him will. His desire is for those who don't know him to be saved. So there's the patience of God and there's the kindness of God. Ephesians 2, 7, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. His devotion and love for men, his kindness, his patience and his kindness are intended to lead men to repentance, to lead us to himself, so that we'll turn from our sin and turn to him. Romans 2, 4, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that it's God's kindness that it, that it is intended to lead you to repentance. So there's the kindness of God. There's the faithfulness of God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. If he says he'll do it, he'll do it. He is trustworthy. He always keeps his word. If a covenant between God and man is broken, it's man who does the breaking, not God. He is faithful and he is true. So there's the faithfulness of God, and he's faithful, and that's a display of his love. There's the goodness of God. And one final time, we look at Exodus 33, 19 again. He says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I mean, we experience the goodness of God. It's something that's, goodness is something that's absolute in God and only relative in man. We are only good as we relate to God and as we display his characteristics in our life. As the, the fruit of the Spirit, as we become more like Him. God is the only one who's truly good, but He is good, thankfully. The knowledge of God is another aspect of His love. Galatians 4, 9. But now, since you know God, or rather have become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and bankrupt element, elemental forces? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? 1 Corinthians 8, 3, if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Once you're known by God, you are loved by God. You know his love. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, for God to know us is for him to love us. Those two things go together. Part of being known by God is having that intimate, spiritual, personal relationship with him. And that's when we really discover love for the first time, through that relationship. Because to be known by him, because he is love, means that we are loved. We experience that love that he has for us. So we've seen the doctrine of God, and we've raced through a lot of this, a lot to chew on, a lot to think about, but we've seen it from the perspective of his activity that he creates, he controls his creation, he redeems mankind, and he also will finish what he started. And then we've looked at his attributes, and really from two different, in two different categories. That God is a personal spirit, but he's also holy love. And, and we learn a lot from those other things. But, but what's the practical side of this? You know, if we, if we just gain knowledge without application, then we, we are sinning. If we don't use what we know. So what's the practical side of this? Well, the practical side of this we see in 1 John 4, 12, where we're told that, that no man has seen God, but that God's love is being perfected in us. So... In a sense, a very real sense, those who don't know God look for him and those of us who claim to be followers of of his. As we become like him, we show others what he's like. He uses us. That's one of the ways he manifests his presence. We are to be like God so that others will see him and experience his love through us each day. As we center our lives around him, he's the center As he molds us, as he shapes us, 
we become more like him. Others see him in us, that he uses that to draw him to himself, but also that's how, going back to the power illustrate, that's how we survive in life. Because he can handle it, we can't. I mean, I would much rather place my life and the circumstances of my life in the hands of the one that created and controls it all than to try to do it myself. But the key is that we have to become like him. 1 Peter 1.16, it is written, Be holy because I am holy. 1 John 4.11, Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, he also must, we also must love one another. We are to be like God so that others will see him. And, and, and as we go through life and we handle things that seem impossible as we do things individually together that are beyond our abilities, God is glorified and people see him in us. I want you to think about it this way, all right? I've got um, a paper towel roll, simple paper towel roll. And we're going to say just for the purposes of our little illustration this morning that that represents God. And I've got these books. Now, it's not very, very impossible, not, not, a, not far-fetched to think that these books, that this paper towel roll could hold these books up. It's not very far-fetched if it actually works. Bear with me. Almost. There you go. Okay. Not done yet. <laughs> so hang in there. But, you know, it's, it's pretty strong. It's, it's not that impossible to imagine this happening. And, why, you know, while we don't understand how God does what he does, we can at least, this morning we got just, you know, barely a grip on it, right? We can come to some kind of understanding. So, if this is God, then this is us. Now, how possible is it? (laughs) Some of you actually think I'm going to pull this off. But, you know, not a whole lot there, right? Not a whole lot of a chance by itself. I mean, this is us. We are weak in and of ourselves. We can't do it on our own. But there is a way that we can reflect the character of God And there is a way that we can display the power of God and that we can handle whatever life brings, whatever that is, that we can endure. We can't control it on our own, our lives or anything, but in his power we can. So let's take a different approach here. See if I can make it work. We take the same role, and in our lives, the the, the challenge, the calling is for us to center our lives around him and to allow him to shape us into what he wants us to be, right? And that's, that's what's involved in putting God in the center of our lives. And, you know, Scripture t- clearly teaches sanctification, that we'll, we'll be, we will be molded and shaped into the image of God each day as we serve him. So that's what we're doing here. We're, we're allowing God to shape us. He is at the center. We now at least look like him, Right? So we take this, and now at least there's some, some resemblance, right? It looks, looks very similar, and that's, that's the idea is that we become like God. So now, on our own, not going to happen. Let's try it now, all right? Everybody cross your fingers. Not that you should be superstitious, but, you know, to make me feel better. Okay, there's one. This is what I do at home when I'm bored, in case y'all were wondering. There's two. All right, you think? Should I try it? All right, let's give it a shot. There you go. So if we, want, if we want to make it in life, if we want others to see God in us, the difference between this and this is this. The difference between us not only surviving in life but thriving, the difference between us reflecting the glory and the character of God is whether or not our lives have been shaped by him. If you want the power of God in your life, he's got to do the the shaping. Complete and total surrender. God is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the redeemer. And he will finish what he started. The only way to know him is to have a personal relationship with him through his, his son, Jesus Christ. The only way to be shaped by him is to have him living in and through you. And the only way that happens is to accept the gift of salvation that only he offers. 
And if you're here today, and I'm, I'm talking about all of these things, and, and you're gaining some education here, but you don't have that intimate knowledge. You're like me with Bart Starr. I know who he is, but I don't have a relationship with him. Never did. If that's you, when it comes to Jesus Christ, when it comes to God, the one and only, then I invite you to accept his invitation to get to know him today, to receive the gift of salvation, forgiveness for your sins. That redemption that I described, that could be you. You could be redeemed by his blood. He paid the price for your sins. If you will accept him, then you will be his. And in you, he will begin a work that one day he will finish. And that, that, that finishing moment will be experienced when you see him face to face in eternity and spend all of eternity with him. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, there's, God, there's so much we can know about you, and there's so much, even with what we know, there's so much that we don't know about you. You are above our ability to describe, above our ability to comprehend. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. Yet, thankfully, in your grace, you choose to reveal yourself to us through your word, through your activity in creation. As you manifest your presence in our lives, we get to know you. And the more we live for you, the more we grow in you, the more we do know you. And it is just grace that you give us that privilege. Lord, I pray that, that, that today in this room, that if there's someone here today who has the head knowledge, they've got some knowledge, at least now, even after this message, they have some knowledge of you. But Lord, if they don't know you personally through your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that during this time of commitment, that they would come and receive that gift. Allow me to share with them how to be saved. To tell them about your precious gift of salvation. Lord, for those of us who know you, the question for us is, are we reflecting you in our daily lives? Are others seeing you in us? Are we being shaped by you daily? And is that evident in our actions, in the way that we live, in the way that we love others? If not, what do we need to do to get our lives in line, to submit to you? What is it that we're not doing or what is it that we're holding on to that we need to submit to you? Whatever it is, Father, I pray that, that we would be dedicated to being like you and becoming more like you and to sharing your name, to glorifying your name to the nations, to everyone that you give us the privilege of sharing with. Lord, whatever it is that you want us to do during this time of commitment, if it's a decision to trust you, to rededicate, to be a part of this church family, to, to be baptized, what, whatever it is, Father, I pray that we would be obedient and respond to your word, for it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?